There we go. Ooh. All right, a couple of extra buttons today. Good evening, everybody. Happy 4th of July weekend. A long weekend finally upon us. Uh, Christy here with the National EMS Museum. I'm with our president, Doc Clinchy, and our very special guest slash volunteer slash member of the museum and historian of Jefferson Mills Rescue Squad, uh, James Covey. So welcome this evening. Thank you, Christy. Super. Glad it's to be here. And um, we will, of course, entertain questions going into the comments. If you happen to be of the area and have memories of Jefferson Mills Rescue Squad, please share your memories in the comments. Otherwise, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. I'm really excited. Good evening, everybody. And hi, Jim. And hey. this is going to be the easiest coffee with Doc I have ever done. Um, because basically, I'm going to turn this over to Jim. And he's going to tell us about the history of the Jefferson Mills Rescue Squad. Fascinating history. Founded in 1959 by Jim's grandfather, I think if I have it correct. Yep. And uh, continued operationally until 1967. Correct. And so uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. He's going to go to do a share screen thing and you'll begin to see some of the materials that he's put together that is really fascinating stuff. So, Jim, over to you. Let's hear the history of Jefferson. All right. Mills. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, first of all, before I start sharing here, thank you, Christy and uh, Doc, for having me on. Uh, I'm quite proud to share this story. Uh, it's kind of, you could call it a lot of different things. Uh, it's definitely a story of folks that uh, was pulled together in 1959 and come together to serve a small community in uh, Pulaski, Virginia. So, um, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I'm going to go through the presentation and then uh, <clears throat> we'll open up for questions and and uh, so I'm ready to entertain you here. So let me get it, get the uh, before I get started. Let me tell you a little bit about myself before I share. Like I'm James Covey again. My grandfather is James Covey Senior. It's the founder of this squad. Uh, I currently live in uh, Henderson, Nevada, but I grew up in uh, Bradford, Virginia, right next to Pulaski, where my family is from, and. Um, and this is where this all the setting is in Pulaski, Virginia. So let's get started. Uh, thanks again. And then uh, looking forward to the questions afterwards. Uh, really, really proud to share this to you. Here we go. Okay, uh, let me do a screen check. Everybody can see my screen okay? We're good. Awesome. We're good. Everybody can hear me okay? You're good. Awesome. All right. Here we go, guys. So, again, proud to be here and, and share this story. Uh, first thing you're seeing on here is the Jefferson Mills Rescue Squad building. Now, it looks kind of small. Uh, a lot of stuff was small back. I don't know if you ever go back during your childhood, early, early days, everything seems like it's a dollhouse. Well, I tell you, they didn't need anything too big. I just needed to a uh, place for uh, the Rescue Squad folks to hang out. But you'll see it there, the Jefferson Mills Rescue Squad. It's a homemade sign, obviously. Uh, my dad was in the sign, sign painting. He might have had something to do with that. And then the Green Cross for Safety up top there. So, again, this started in 1959 through 1967. Uh, and I kind of call it this presentation, and really the whole thing when I speak about it, is legacy of service. And that's exactly what it was. This year marks the 62nd anniversary of the Jefferson Mills Rescue Squad. They charted it, incorporated it fully. And again, this was an idea of the Jefferson Mills employee, my grandfather, James Covey Sr., to bring together a group of Jefferson Mills employees to serve the needs of the small community of Pulaski, Virginia. Now they had, I think they had another rescue squad that was a little bit more over, but they didn't have one directly servicing Pulaski. So uh, they seen a need there for that as well. So on March 12th, 1959, uh, it was it was definitely the start of something special, as you will learn this presentation. And it would continue through 1967 when they changed the name to New River Valley uh, Emergency Squad when the company of Jefferson Mills didn't want to be uh, involved any longer. And I'll give you the background on as well. And then that went on to serve from 67 to 96, and when it was when the squad was uh, terminated and they moved it into a county government. So uh, I got to tell you, uh, as you'll learn through this whole thing, the legacy of service these incredible men and women provided will live in the hearts of their families and friends forever. So 
uh, they definitely reminds me, and I wanted to put this quote in here. They definitely lived up to the, these famous words below here. And that, as you guys all know them in the inaugural address of John F. Kennedy. And so my fellow Americans ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And I want you guys to keep in mind as we go through these, these wonderful men and women that I'll talk about, they did not receive a salary. This was all volunteer. And this was simply drawn out of the passion of folks that wanted to fulfill and follow this message uh, from John F. Kennedy. So let's get started. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the founder, and that's my grandfather, um, James Covey Sr. He, <clears throat> he didn't have a long life. <laughs> he lived from 1920 to 1970, but, but it didn't really start. Uh, I mean, he did something completely different before the Jefferson Mills Rescue Squad. He ended up being part of the uh, founding of uh, the WPUV, WPUV radio station in the 40s when radio stations were the main source of entertainment through broadcasting stuff like the mutual broadcasting affiliate like NBC, ABC is today. They would do old radio shows. Now, so they would have live entertainment like concerts that we see today. They would go into radio stations and broadcast to the community. My grandfather was part of that. He had his own band. Uh, you know, they were the first band to perform on the radio. He got to know famous artists such as Bill and Charlie Moreau when they were touring his brothers. Uh, actually, also Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys. He got uh, Red and Smiley, a lot of those folks. So that was a big part of his life, young life. And then once that was done, he got his feel of that. He started working in Jefferson Mills. He was incredibly mechanically inclined. He was worked on the equipment at Jefferson Mills. I'll give you a shot of that here in a minute. Tell you a little bit about the company, but he was um, quite involved uh, mechanically and, and, and did all the stuff around there. So a uh, very talented person. So then he had the opportunity to find, find the uh, rescue squad here. And I, I put a little collage of stuff that he was involved on, but, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more of each one of these pictures that you see. So you're probably asking yourself, how did he come up with the idea of starting a rescue squad? Well, you see this screen here. It's kind of a screenshot of an actual TV show that was very similar to the latter day uh, show of emergency that, that was on this podcast a month or so ago. Uh, with the Randy Mantooth, they talked about the emergency, popular emergency TV series in the 70s. Well, this one went on for a couple of years in 1958, 59. It was a little bit different. It wasn't um, a drama type piece. Um, it that was drama and showing the rescue piece. But this show was more of an educational program, uh, showing folks, you know, teaching the public and community what to do in emergency situations. Not only from the rescue person's angle, but what they can do as a community member to help save lives. You know, uh, you know safety tips or whatever in a fire and they would add that to the educational program to get a chance to look up of it is some of it on youtube but uh you'd recognize some famous actors in there jim davis who's famous for being the dallas tv matriarch uh and then there was another one uh, jeffrey's individual name by jeffrey lang jeffrey's was the other co-star that played the fireman but my grand my grandfather would watch this in uh, 1959 and like everybody else he had been watching it before but uh as they got into the year 1959, and it was at a time when the, the company was doing, Jefferson Mills was doing a lot of uh, first aid training. Uh, so they were at the peak of that at that time. And he would watch a show and he literally, he even said when he, uh, when I discovered a history piece that he wrote in the paper, he even said that he envisioned himself as one of the characters on this program. Um, and then he realized then that time, three years later when he wrote the history, that that was the start of Jefferson Mills Rescue Squad. In addition to the high, the peak they were at the company he was working at, Jefferson Mills, of doing first aid training uh, through the safety piece, because it was an industrial piece. It was a Jefferson Mills yarn. They did yarn uh, spools, uh, and that's what they produced. So let's move on to the next one. Let me talk about this Jefferson Mills for a little bit. So. As he was watching this show, like he said, he envisioned himself as one of the uh, characters and possibly starting this in this hometown. So he approached the uh, gentleman by the name of Roscoe Cox, who was a personnel manager. 
on the idea of organizing a rescue squad here at the mill. Uh, the HR manager was very enthused. He offered 100% cooperation as well as the CEO and the senior management. Next, they consulted with the safety director who was with, uh, was with them as well all the way. So now they had the nucleus to start the organization. So in less than a week, they had 28 members that was interested. That's amazing in less than a week during that time. And that's, that goes back to that key theme word I talked about, that magical time. People really wanted to help others and had a passion for it. So they, uh, all they needed now was uniforms. So they contacted uh, Sweet Ore Company, who was a local uniform company. They didn't have a treasure, so they had to dig in their pockets for each member and pay for their own uniform. Not only they're willing to give their time, they're going to pay for their uniforms. <laughs> but they still had a long ways to go before they called themselves a rescue squad. So uh, the town attorney uh, jumped in and helped them in giving them some legal advice. But they think their greatest help uh, came, he thinks our greatest help came from Julian Wise. My grandfather reached out to, and he was the president of Roanoke Life Saving Crew. He, if there was anyone who knew life saving, he knew it because he was uh, the person to start the first rescue squad in the company. So Mr. Wise was very helpful to advise and, and assist the organization um, of, of getting the squad developed. He tamed, he actually also, my grandfather, uh, James Covey Sr., he attained a copy of the bylaws and constitution you know, electing officers and what have you. And um, after they got that going, they started thinking what we're going to call ourselves. Well, the most logical name, and I think it was pretty easy. They're all Jefferson Mills employees. We're going to call this the Jefferson Mills Rescue Squad. So the mill was very generous. They uh, they allowed them to use their attorneys. And they paid for the incorporating fees and uh, and they were very proud of the fact that they were now going to be part of the Virginia State Association Rescue Squads as well. They had met the high standards of the operation that the association requires to get the certification. So they were ready now to get the first aid supplies and equipment. So they started taking up donations by raffling off lawnmowers. If you're from the South, you know lawnmowers are pretty popular. <laughs> um, but in addition to the raffles, the employees of the mill this wasn't uh, just 28 folks. This was the entire mill. Employees of the mill played a major role in financing the organization by having portion of their wages deducted each week by payroll, and they turned them. The company turned them over to the squad. How amazing is that? It allowed them to purchase the first truck, which was a 1954 Chevy model panel truck, and they converted it into a combination cash truck and ambulance. Uh, the local funeral home donated to the squad an ambulance cot to go in the truck. And then the Pulaski Police Department denoted, donated a squad, a siren, and a red light to be placed on the truck. They were given uh, phones at the mill for emergency calls. They had designated phone numbers. Enabled us, they enabled them to set up operations on a small, small scale from one of the buildings. They later moved to a fire department parking lot. And then they tamed some badly needed oxygen equipment. Uh, it was donated by the Virginia Heart Association. They needed to move closer to the mill. So um, with the public donations, along with the donation of employees, they purchased a lot on the local street there nearby the mill, and it's uh, which was now occupied by the mill. So they operated from that first site and obtained additional funds and converted the lot into a parking lot for the mill employees convenience, which they also rented preferred parking to help raise money as well. <laughs> So um, enough about the company, but I kind of want to show you here. That's kind of how it got started, a really an engine. So at that time, Jefferson Mills, they had just went the time, the year of the founding, 1959, they had a total of 459 employees uh, it's right below that you'll see. And also, you look up here, I was telling you about the Green Cross from Safety, which was part of the Navy, National Safety Council. Uh, they were... Um, they really adopted their, their methods of training, what have you. And just to show you, give you an idea of how much the organization, out of the 450, 364 of the company completed a standard first aid training course during that year that of the founding of the rescue squad. 75 of the employees had advanced first aid graduates and six of those had instructors course, which literally became the first leadership 
of the Jefferson Mills Rescue Squad that they founded in March of that year. And they had two first aid trucks by the end of the year. So uh, the other picture here is the uh, sky view of the Mill, Jefferson Mills building, which unfortunately was torn down recently. It's just a blot on what they're gonna put there now, but this is what it looked like back, uh, this is a recent picture maybe from 10 years ago, but that was the parking lot in front I was telling you that they raised funds with renting a preferred parking. Uh, also, uh, this is with the Rescue Squad building was right in this parking lot. Next up, I wanted to tell you about the uh, first news article about the Jefferson Squad. Uh, one thing's for sure, they had a lot of coverage in the local newspaper. And this one here, after they were founded in March of 1959, they still had some legwork to do, as I was just telling you with the company, getting the legal paperwork, getting the uh, certified by Virginia, by three Virginia state laws, Julian Wise working with them and telling them what they knew with the bylaws, officers, uh, their officers appointed and what have you. But this kind of talks about the Jefferson Squad, Jefferson Squad being ready for the community rescue work. So, and it gives the members here, there was 28 members again uh, in the inaugural charter group. And here's a picture, I think it was one of the very first pictures um, this is not all 28, but this was their first set of uniforms. And uh, you'll see, here's my grandfather and some other key folks. Uh, I, forget this, so I got them all listed down here for just credit, but uh, definitely pretty lively group that's interested, very proud of them, very sharp in their uniforms. Uh, Doc and I was talking a little bit before we started, and Christy, how proud and the passion that's involved in doing this type of work and for no pay and literally paying for your own uniform. But the squad, here's the panel truck behind it. It has Jefferson Mills. I'll show you a picture of that later in uh, Jefferson Mills Rescue Squad. And then the uh, siren, the light, and then the cot inside, of course. I told you about them being in the news quite often. They had plenty of articles written up on them and deservingly so they did a lot of work a lot of work between all of them it's just amazing when you think about the coordination of the shifts working around the clock they literally they work 24 the co the company provided the heating air uh, restroom facilities the phone when they got their little building so they were able to they did this 24 hours they did the shift work and this is on top of their regular jobs uh, they were able to spread it out pretty good with 28 to start with, but it's just amazing. Not only did they serve the community in providing medical service, emergency medical service, transporting people to the hospital, answering calls, first aid, uh, you know, wrecks, you name it, drown, you know, folks having, they may have drowned in a river or, or what have you, all the different types of emergency. They also celebrated Rescue Squad Week every spring, and it's always been in the spring. They've had different names for it but they've always been part of that. And they would showcase all the equipment like these folks are doing here. These are micro fish copies and the quality is not incredible, but you get the idea. Um, but every one of these pictures, you just see the prideful look on their faces. It's, it's just amazing. These folks are showing all the equipment. Um, you know, they, they got trained when they first got trained, they got on, uh, uh, they had just invented the closed chest cardiac uh, method um, up in Baltimore, several of them went up to the Baltimore Hospital to do that, and even some on Johns Hopkins. Uh, they had all those uh, types of equipment. You, the latest in life-saving equipment, they would, sh they would share that as well as their vehicles. It was quite something to see. As you can see here, you can see the initial vehicles. Um, see the panel truck back here. It looks like we got a couple uh, station wagons, possibly. I uh, see a VA there. Might be a registration number of some sort. And here's three of the uh, the folks in uniform, they had the dark uniforms. And then later on, they had the white jumpsuits. Uh, Doc and I was talking about that. Um, and then here's the, uh, here's a rescue squad. They had a big um, Jefferson Mills rescue squad volunteers at age, age stranded. Volunteers, key word, no pay. Uh, they went around the clock. It was a big, big snow, uh, huge snow. It just buried everybody. And they had a lot of calls, uh, as you see here. Um, 
from the squad it says it's carrying inside. See here, the patient was one of 10 taken to hospital by the volunteer workers since Saturday. And the men along with James Covey, captain, so also provided transportation for over 100. Not only these folks didn't have to have emergency call, they were rescuing you because they were stranded. Uh, they delivered fuel, pulled cars from drifts. Uh, it didn't stop just with the rescue work. They did it all. Um, other stories, mobile unit organized, yep, emergency first aid. They actually made kits for their own personal vehicles. They didn't let a few vehicles stop them on their own personal vehicles. They made mobile unit organized. They made these kits where they would be able to provide that service in their personal vehicle. They also did community service. In addition to the overall community, they did specific stuff like training Girl Scouts. Um, again, the rescue work. This is a picture, you don't see the picture of my granddad's training this whole group of Girl Scouts on first aid. Um, they also, the biggest thing they did was the blood mobile drive, assisting the Red Cross on their blood mobile drives every year. Uh, they would really challenge themselves. If you could see the print on this paper, you would see, we did this many last year and we're hoping they always set the higher goal. You know, they would drive people to the, that couldn't make it. They would drive them to they can give their plan of blood. Uh, they would really hold them and, and do a lot of promotion. And they were hugely involved with that every, maybe a couple times a year, whenever the blood mobile would come. So this key one to keep the squad alive they didn't have, they had to rely on the donations. They had to rely on the free services. They had to rely on uh, pretty much about any, they had to be creative uh, to keep the squad alive and the fundraising. Nothing's for free. Everything costs something. Of course, the prices were a little bit better back then, but you're looking at the prices for that time. It was a, lot, a little bit of money would be a lot to them based on the economies at that time. So they would do stuff like, Variety shows, um, they do a full on. Like my grandfather had that little bit of background entertainment. He put it to use with this too, as well as a lot of the other folks. A lot of the people in the squad were World War II veterans, just came back, uh, you know, within too long, out, you know, less than 10 years out of coming back from the war, some of them five years. Uh, um, well, excuse me, get my dates. Less than 20 years coming out of the World War II. They were World War II veterans. There's my grandfather handing out some free tickets to the Hollywood Hillbilly stage. Uh, it was an event they sponsored with uh, some entertainment. Um, the, the tickets were purchased by children, by local merchants, doctors, and citizens. And they would take a little bit of that money for the fundraising and they, and they would give the tickets away to the underprivileged children. Uh, they would even do a, a United Nations a circus. They would be the sponsor of that and they would sell the tickets. And there was always a little bit of, probably a little bit of a cut that they could use for fundraising to support the squad. And they usually would display their vehicles or equipment. They take the opportunity to help promote. They would do parking at the uh, old baseball stadium to try to get uh, some fundraising out of that too. You name it, they did it. Other ones you see here, again, I told you about the employee donations via payroll deductions. Uh, the preferred employee parking rentals, variety talent shows at lawnmower raffles, as well as a lot of other stuff, you know, small TVs. I just got some recent pictures of them giving a the TV away, and it was during a, a beauty pageant, annual beauty pageants, dealership loan to vehicles. My granddaughter, grandfather would write letters to the dealership. The same time he's writing proposals for town budget support. Um, I'll show you one of those vehicles here shortly equipment donations, free use of services, legal services by the company's lawyers, dinner events, and of course the company time, telephone uses. I told you about the restroom facilities, heating air, what have you. They had a lot of sources, so they had to rely on quite a bit of that. And in addition to running the squad, they were always concerned in making sure we got the money to keep it going. So uh, moving on here, in addition to the squad, the group I showed you earlier, the wives of those folks and even other employees, they wanted to be involved in too. So in 1960, a year after the squad started, they founded the Jefferson Mills Auxiliary Corps. So 
you know, they had some standards set to bring the members on, even they, you know, were the wives of the, sure they had a little bit of buyer there, but, you know, they had some standards to become a member of their core, you know, and uh, these were the same ones when you joined the, the men joined the Jefferson Mills Rescue Squad. Good character, high morale, sound judgment, and passing the standard first aid course within a year. Then you could be a member of Jefferson Mills Auxiliary Corps. The purpose of the auxiliary was to assist and help the squad in its effort to save lives, minister first aid, teach safety, and assist in case of emergency. Local members were also, auxiliary members were also a member of the Virginia Association of Southwestern Districts. They held meetings. Uh, the local unit served as a host uh, as well, and they had a convention every year in Richmond. Uh, but courses they took was, again, the standard invest, advanced first aid courses that uh, Doc and I were talking about earlier. Um, part of the money that they raised would support, support their auxiliary core, their activities, and they would do stuff like bake sales, selling candy, Christmas candles, concession stand activities. They are also, the auxiliary is also inactive in helping the rescue squad in various community activities, such as the blood mobile, cancer drive, polio and heart fund drives, and also the Salvation Army has been, they assisted by the, they were assisted by the auxiliary and, and a needy family was given food, clothes, and toys at Christmas time. One of the highlights uh, too of their service was decorating the new rescue squad headquarters I showed you earlier. And then again, they served as a welcome committee for uh, the governor of, Governor Albertus Harrison that toured when he came to town. I'll show you that in a minute. But here's a picture of some of the squad members in the building, inside the building, um, you know, they were probably waiting on calls or what have you. Here's my grandfather here, as well as some of the other keys. I got their names here. I couldn't identify three of them at the time, but um, but it's a small building, but it, it, it did the job. <laughs> uh, here's the pictures of the Virginia governor visitor visiting the building after it had been built. And at the time it was Albertus Harrison. And here's the auxiliary Corps welcoming them. It was quite uh, the affair and just showcasing what they, what Jefferson Mills did and supporting the rescue squad and what they started beyond the community, beyond the yarn production, the textile production. They would make communities of their lives enrich their own lives by giving to the community in these ways and work. And it's just amazing, amazing of the teamwork put together and the passion, not just by a few, I literally almost, I mean, over 90% of the folks, if, if not sometimes at 100%, it's amazing. Here's the proudest moment uh, during my research of the Jefferson Mills Rescue Squad. Um, I thought this was pretty neat. Um, my father, actually, James Covey Jr. and James Covey Sr., uh, I, my father got involved with the Rescue Squad uh, when he was a young man. Uh, before he went in the Air Force as a teenager. And he would drive the vehicle sometimes. On this occasion, uh, my grandfather brought him along and uh, they went to pick up, because in case he needed any help, they went up to pick up um, a woman in her pregnancy. Uh, the baby was coming, they went and picked her up. Uh, I don't know, if she may have been alone at the time, but they went and picked her up. It was heading towards a Chitwood Clinic in nearby Withville, Virginia. They stopped three or four times and um, they got as far as the Withfield Drive-In Theater. <laughs> My granddad had taken some training at Johns Hopkins. And as he said in the quote after the, when he was interviewed, it came in very handy. Uh, he delivered the baby, which is a seven pound, seven ounce boy. And then they proceeded to the clinic. So she was in good condition that same day. He, his quote was, he says, I was very excited, I realized Something had to be done. I got as far as I could, and then uh, my my father pulled the vehicle off, and he delivered the baby. I think he may have pulled the vehicle off, and then my grand my father may have went on to the hospital while my grandfather was back. But uh, I thought this was pretty neat, pretty proud thing <laughs> that a rescue man uh, becomes a doctor all of a sudden. Here is a picture of my grandfather with one of those vehicles. And you'll see uh, it's got Jefferson Mills. This is a, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Doc, what's that type of vehicle? It looks like a Chevy, don't it? Um, anyway. Maybe a uh, Pontiac or a Caddy, maybe? Yeah, possibly. Um, Pontiac, I think. Not sure. Yeah. 
anyway, you see the Jefferson Mills Rescue, Pulaski, Virginia, and they gave credit to the person donating, courtesy of Luttrell Chevrolet, which is a, there was oh. a couple of dealerships popular, yeah. Chevy then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hello, that tells us, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, it's a Chevy. So we had the siren and the and the whole nine yards, and he's in his full uniform prowl. Now, the reason I show you this picture is, is, is this vehicle was parked at the house, and there was a reason for that. This was 1966, and uh, at the time in 1960, right before 1967, they changed the number of name to New River Valley Rescue Squad at the top of the year because the company didn't want to be part of it any longer. So I think they started moving, uh, parking the vehicles at my grandfather's house and even the dispatch phones for three years, up to three years possibly before my grandfather died in 1970, the dispatch was right behind this wall in his home. And my grandmother was a big part of the dispatch. She actually dispatched calls. Um, and then they ran the, they had the vehicles there. And the building even, I think, was moved. I don't have any pictures of it, but the building was moved to his property here. It had a little bit more property down below. Uh, I don't have much facts to go on to what transpired on that, but I do know at least part of the building, if it was used or if they were able to connect electricity or what have you. But I do know that the radio, I confirmed that with someone that was a neighborhood friend that's still living and uh, that was in there for at least two years minimum, if not longer. And again, my grandfather, my my dad and his two brothers and, and sister, they became, they ran calls as teenagers. And I was telling Dr. Law earlier, I think uh, the gentleman, the neighbor that shared with me, they, him and his, he was friends with my father's brother. And they took off in one of the vehicles one time on a joyride when he wasn't around, <laughs> turned the siren on. So uh, pretty interesting story, but I thought that was how they just, the phone calls came, the emergency calls came right to here for at least a couple of years. So next up is uh, Julian Wise, to give you a little bit more feature on him. So 1967, they changed the name to New River Valley Rescue Squad. And in that following top of the year, they elected officers every year. And I thought this was neat. They would give them always an opportunity to everyone to lead the squad if they wanted to. So they changed out officers, and usually the officer's name was president, vice president, captain, uh, maybe a few other titles. And sometimes I think they even had it put on their badge. I'm going to show you a badge now that has vice president on it. But they'd have a dinner. And in addition to the beginning of the squad, they also, uh, Julian Wise helping out to, at the beginning and being a consultant, yeah, he was invited and came and spoke at this event. Uh, and he gave some advice like he always does. He's the pioneer. And I thought they start this article off right at the beginning. Um, it is our duty to use our God-given power to help those in distress. I thought that was pretty powerful with the word power in it, but it's also a pretty powerful statement, uh, unquote. So, and he also challenged, uh, he, he, another thing he says in here, it says, uh, the wise of Father Rescue Squads extended greetings to the local squad from the National International Association of Rescue Squads. And he says, America has a great respect for Virginia squads. Wise challenged the local group to do its best. It's our heritage and we must carry on. It is a duty of every squad member to become familiar with the hazards of rescue work and how to avoid them. So um, these suggestions were passed on, to the, uh, passed on to the officers and my father was a captain at the time. He rotated around. But he was, uh, you know, they always looked up to him. He did a lot of the legwork, obviously, as being the founder and keeping those things together. Um, Julian Wise, a uh, pretty important figure, and it's an honor to know that my grandfather and the rescue squad was, uh, you know, closely connected to him, and he had a role in that. Okay, this next one, and I'm almost done here, folks. Thanks for listening to this incredible story. I'm so proud to share uh, I will tell you, in addition to that story about my grandfather, uh, you know, delivering a baby, this was a, probably the next big thing. You know, as I was doing the research and going back, this main paper, local Southwest Times was the main paper. That's where I did most of it. Grabbed microchip. Uh, micro, when it started out, I was getting micro uh, film from the library and actually looking through archive books. 
that has evolved as our technology has evolved. Now I'm able to do it on news archive on your own, on my cell phone. Isn't it amazing? Uh, <laughs> so going from printing to having it on my phone and doing screenshots. So this one here, I came across, I was trying to look, I was getting bits and pieces of it. I was trying to find something that an uh, article that would put it all together. So I found this article and coincidence, it was written by my grandfather. <laughs> so I'm not going to read the article to you. I do have the, the text, but uh, I'll, I'll copy it. I'll read a couple things from it that I maybe didn't cover. And we'll end with that. So um, let me see here. So I'll talk about again about the um, training. Okay. So the training of these guys, obviously you need a good training to be confident and go out and provide your services. You will be assured of a well-trained crew when need of our services. And this is right from my grandfather's pen. Uh, we have five members in our squad who have been trained in the application of closed chest cardiac massage. These men were trained at Baltimore City Hospital by the doctor who discovered this technique at John Hopkins Hospital, Baltimore, Maryland. Not sure who that is, doc, maybe you know. Uh, we have handled most every kind of emergency, including childbirth. Nice little feather to reference there. <laughs> we have qualified first aid instructors who are available anytime for first aid classes, which you might like to start. And this is in the paper, I remember. Today, I'm sure each member feels that this individual time and efforts have been well spent, even though they are on a voluntary basis. Each member has gained a lot of experience and knowledge in this field of rescue work. He is fully satisfied, she is fully satisfied that on he or she's way somewhere, they have helped ease the pain and save the life of a human being. This summarizes the organization known as the Jefferson Mills Rescue Squad. And I thought that was a good thing to end this with, but um, just a couple more things. There's a patch and the badge, pretty simple deal. I thought it was neat how they had a little typo, they didn't put the S behind Mills, but. Uh, this is a badge I was telling you about. This is actually on a hat. Um, it's got vice president, the title, and I think they had one that said captain. And it's got the, actually, they used the Green Cross of Safety and then Jefferson Mills and Kulaski. Um, to go back to tell you a little bit more, again, this went from 1959 to 1967, a magical time of that. Uh, and then it went to become New York Valley Rescue Squad, which went on to 1996 with a whole nother generation of folks serving, including uh, my aunt, who is, uh, they're, they're, the family is no longer living, none of them are alive, but my aunt became the first woman, uh, female, first female rescuer on the squad. Uh, she didn't join, of course, she actually joined the squad. And that set the doors open for a lot of folks in the 70s and 80s. And it, uh, they continued. They were at football games, you know, the normal stuff, uh, sporting events, what have you, wherever they needed to be on standby, and again, certain community. Uh, and then just want to let you know, uh, memories of Jefferson Mills Rescue Squad. I started this Facebook page. Please come on and join. And started in 2019 and with the 60th anniversary and then, of course, the following year. And then each year I changed the picture out. But email if you have any questions, uh, but I'm be happy to entertain any questions now, if you have any. Um, and like I said, uh, we do have the time, but I appreciate your attention in allowing me. Thanks again, Christy and Doc, for allowing me to share this wonderful story. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm continuing the research as I continue to fill in the blanks. I hope uh, there's a possibility of writing a small book about this at some point. And uh, I think it's a story to tell and it's a page turner. And not only about the rescue squad, but as the about a company sponsored rescue squad in a company setting like that. I, it's just uh, pretty amazing. So um, I'm going to turn it back over to Doc, Christy, um, however you want to facilitate the questions, but um, I can answer them as long as you'd like. Christy, did we get anything in on the uh, chat? No, lots of likes and loves. And uh, just, I think everybody is really fascinated by uh, the story and um, how companies can support the rescue industry as well, uh, that it wasn't just uh, community-based 
volunteer squads, but there were company-based volunteer squads as well. So thank you so much for sharing your yeah. story with us, your family story, I suppose. You weren't. Yeah, you were it was. Uh, to be involved. Jim, I think one of the most remarkable things about the story you tell is the legacy of EMS in this country and how much mm -hmm. of it was volunteer from the start. Yeah. And the thousands of hours that volunteer EMS people put in. Remarkable. And the passion is just, it blows me away. I mean, the company set the tone by sponsoring with all that first aid training. And, and they were determined, as you've seen, to those end of the messages about what they did and trying to enrich their lives by going beyond the production. Yep. And, you know, they in, they were, this was a high time for them. It was a very old mill that came I think in the early 40s or late 30s from uh, another place. It actually started in 1896 and it came to Pulaski. And this time they grew it to a, I actually got to talk to the HR manager. He's a Iwo Jima veteran. Uh, and he turned into a conversation. He was still living in Pulaski. And I got to verify with him that my grandfather, because there was some questions of folks who started it. That way he said, and I, I wanted to verify and with him. And he, he confirmed that my grandfather did approach him. And uh, he told me about the story of Jefferson Mills. And it was at the peak. The town was booming economically. Everything was up. I mean, going off the charts economically, community service, people helping. It was just amazing, amazing time. I think the Excellent. town is, they were a ghost town for a living. They're starting to come back to Excellent. maybe to that. But I don't know if they'll ever reach it. i got a question for you, Jim. Um, in 1959, they changed the name from Jefferson Mills to New River Emergency Squad. It was 1967, I did. Oh, 67, I'm sorry. Is that because the company was afraid of the liability if they were had their name attached to it? Possibly. Uh, it was also a time when the funeral homes wanted to get out of the business. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what transpired, but it was a time where the company felt the liability uh, because it was starting to grow to the next level. Probably they felt that, oh, it's a little maybe too risky uh, to continue with this. And I think it kind of, it didn't happen too suddenly, but it happened suddenly enough for them to make that name change kind of out of nowhere. And then uh, that's where they needed to, it's worked. I think it got moved to my grandfather's home. And then right before my grandfather died, he started working on the building and created the first floor. Uh, I got a picture of that actually in the paper. Very cool. And it's the same building, the regional emergency medical service, Art Rimsey operates out of today. Very cool. Cool something that really jumped out at me on one of your clippings. There was a date of 5-15-59. That was the day I turned 16 and went to the fire department and became a real volunteer fire. Oh my gosh. Instead of a junior volunteer fire. What a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> the oh other thing God. that leaped, leaped out at me, your rescue aid ad, that was out of a newspaper upstate New York, Carthage and Watertown. Oh, that uh, the rescue eight ad. I just yeah. pulled that here recently. Oh yeah, my have you God. ever heard of the Tenth Mountain Division? I have. Yeah, if you go up the north way in New York State and get off at the Watertown exit, you are at the home of the Tenth Mountain Division. Fort oh my Trump. gosh! Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. There's some trivia for you. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, we got a couple of coincidences there. That was really entertaining yeah. for you, but <laughs> anyway, great story. A great yeah. tribute to volunteer EMS and its history in this country. Yeah. Just remarkable. Yeah, uh, we, um, it's really special when we yeah. like that picture of the squad. When I first saw that, uh, when the, when the form, they actually got a Jefferson Yarns uh, page where folks, former employees, very cool. And, uh, they very shared cool. a picture. Jim, <laughs> thanks. That this was real tough for me tonight. I just sat and listened. It was great. I loved it. Um, yeah. We'll be back in two weeks, Christy. Two weeks, I think. We and Limmer, one week. Uh, July sixteenth, we'll be yeah. back. Uh, Dan yeah, Limmer's two weeks. Dan out. Limmer. If if I can share one more thing with you, you bet. So, when I discovered us this, this history, and you know, growing up, you never you don't think of it. You know, I knew my dad was involved. My dad was actually first day at this company. Um. You know, growing up, you know, you're too busy being a kid, you know, and even as my early years going into a company, but I had always been involved with community service, um, not in the medical piece, but I've always been in the company, I always really reached out and had a passion for that. And of course, I'm a musician too. Um, 
And then later on to discover this and find out the things that he did or family did or whatever. And to know that it just naturally, it didn't even dawn on me. I didn't plan it that way. I'm like, wow. I mean, some of those traits came down on me and I wasn't even, it just naturally did it. I didn't say, hey, my grandfather did that. I want to do that. No, it was the other way around. I found out, gosh, what I'm doing. I got to volunteer in a parade piece. There was a parade float. I was part of the Tournament of Roses for five years out in Pasadena. Cool. Um, so it really is a beautiful connection. And I, my plan is before I retire or in retirement, I'm going to at least get the, as a tribute, I don't know if I'll go through the whole EMT, but I at least get the Red, uh, the Red Cross um, Emergency Medical Technician training, uh, the first or maybe the advanced, we'll see. But uh, cool. I don't know how much I will do with it, but I just want to kind of do it and kind of get a taste. Cool. Of it. Thanks again for your time. Oh, thank Great you, guys. Appreciate it. Have a wonderful July 4th. You bet. Yeah, Bye -bye. Have a good absolutely. holiday weekend, thank everybody. You thank you. We uh, appreciate you spending your evening with us. And oh, yeah. we'll see you in a few weeks. Take care. Bye. Happy 4th. So long.